If you ever finished a project only to realize you probably should have done some things differently, my lithium battery upgrade for our 25-year-old camper actually worked out great. Adding solar power, an inverter, and a USB charging point were exactly what it needed. But a couple of my design decisions involving having two different batteries now look questionable. So in this video I set out to fix those. Stick around and see what can happen when you try to mix lithium iron phosphate and lead acid batteries. <laughs> Hi, I'm Gary. I'm a retired electrical engineer who makes videos about consumer technology subjects that come along in my life. Recently I did a major power upgrade on our ancient pop-up camper. There's a link to that video in the description. The original system consisted only of a lead-acid battery mounted on the trailer tongue and a conventional RV power converter to charge the battery and supply 12 volts for the lights, the water pump, and the fan and the heater. That was it. I added all these components in this inside cabinet, including a 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery, a solar charge controller, a 600 watt inverter, a USB charging point, and a 20 amp lithium battery charger. That all got crammed into this space, and the resulting circuit diagram for the camper went from this to this. Please don't let that turn you off. I am not going to talk about all that again. This video is just about trying to fix a couple of choices that I wasn't happy about. Both of them came about because in addition to the new lithium battery, I also left the original lead acid battery in place to avoid messing with the weight balance on the trailer tongue. Reducing the tongue weight could have made towing less stable. It will need a bit of context and some simple circuit diagrams to show why this brand new system needed fixing. It seemed a shame not to make use of that 45 pound lead weight, so I wired the old battery as a backup. However, lithium and lead acid batteries may look similar, but they're very different. You can't just connect them together without expecting bad things to happen. My original design used a switch for each battery to turn it on or off and it connected both of them to the 12 volt loads through a fuse panel. This works fine, as long as you don't turn both of them on at once. Even if you do, there won't be any fireworks, because one of the fuses between them will blow if too much current flows between them. But I decided that was still not a good choice, because it might not be evident that anything happened, even though one of the batteries was now unusable. An obvious way to fix this is to isolate the batteries from each other using diodes. This way either battery can feed the loads, but there can't be any current flow between them. This would definitely work. But conventional diodes have a voltage drop of a few hundred millivolts, up to as much as a volt. What this really needed were ideal diodes. A theoretical ideal diode has a current versus voltage curve like this. If you apply a positive voltage to it, current flows with no voltage drop. And in the other direction, current can't flow at all. But real diodes do not work quite like that. A conventional silicon power diode looks like this. Current flow results in a voltage drop, which has two undesirable effects. It reduces the voltage available to the load, and it represents a power loss, which also heats up the diode. In my case, a load current of up to 20 amps could result in perhaps a 14 watt loss. That would probably require heat sinks for the diodes, and I just didn't want to put up with it. There are other kinds of diodes that could be used, but it turns out that it's possible to simulate an ideal diode with an electronic circuit. And I happened to find such a circuit on AliExpress at a very reasonable price. So I bought a couple of them and tested them with a 9 amp load current, which is close to the limit of my power supply, but also near the max load I really expect, the voltage drop in this circuit is only 14 millivolts. So this circuit is only losing an eighth of a watt, compared to over 6 watts for a conventional diode. That's close enough to ideal for this application. 
there obviously needs to be some protection for the exposed terminals. This little plastic box costs less than a dollar from AliExpress, and it holds both of them perfectly. With the addition of a couple of jumper wires, this is ready to be inserted in the existing switch wiring in the camper. So here we go. We just disconnect these two wires, connect them to the diode circuits, connect the diode outputs back to the fuse panel, reassemble the box with all its fiddly little screws that keep falling out, and mount it to the cabinet using some 3M double-sided tape. A quick test shows that it works, and problem number one is solved. The second issue involves how to charge these two dissimilar batteries when you're getting ready for a trip or staying in a campground with shore power available. I put in a 20 amp charger specifically for the lithium iron phosphate battery, and my plan was to disconnect the original 12 volt power converter circuit from the load panel and use it just for charging the lead acid battery. That would have worked. But somewhere in the course of the original installation, the 12 volt converter failed. I'm too lazy and too cheap to replace it, and a direct replacement's no longer made anyway. So the obvious question is, could the lithium charger also charge the lead acid battery? As a rule, you should not try charging a lithium battery with a lead acid charger. But a lithium charger may be able to charge a lead acid battery. There's no guarantee it will charge it fully, but it probably won't hurt it, depending on a number of variables like the charge rate and what it does at end of charge. So I pulled out the charger from the camper, took it to my shop, and did some test cycles with a lead acid battery that happened to be laying around, and it seemed to work okay. The charge started at 14 amperes, and it put in 31 ampere hours before the charger shut off at less than one amp of charging current. A discharge also yielded 31 amp hours, and a second charge put that amount back in. So this charger seemed to work okay, at least with some lead acid battery. In theory, all I needed to add was a switch to select which battery is connected to the charger. This switch from Amazon is ready to carry the full 20 amp output of the charger, and it has built-in LEDs to tell you which position it's in. It's a bit of an awkward shape, so I cut a hole in a blank cover plate and then mounted the switch in a household wiring box. This was now an assembly with a mounting bracket that could be pre-wired for the connections to the charger and the two batteries. I did all this in advance of installing it because temperatures are near freezing in Idaho by now, and I hate working in the cold. Here is some truly dreadful video of me mounting the switch box. On my knees, with my head stuck inside the cabinet, trying to put in screws underneath using a mirror. There clearly were easier ways to do this. But it's done. After that ordeal, connecting the switch to the two batteries and the charger was actually a walk in the park. Now came the moment of truth. Would this arrangement work? Switching the charger to the lithium battery worked fine, of course. It started cranking out its usual 20 amps without complaint, and nothing melted down or caught fire, so the connections were okay. Trying to charge the lead acid battery, on the other hand, not so good. The charger output was only about one ampere. The voltage leaped up to 14.6 volts, and then the charger quickly shut off, even though the battery voltage afterward was only 12.6 volts. This suggested that perhaps the problem was the battery, so I pulled it out for some testing in the shop. A conventional lead acid charger also refused to charge it, so the battery clearly was ailing. But I have a charger that has a desulfation mode that's intended to rejuvenate a battery that has sat too long and built up lead sulfate crystals on the surface of its electrodes. It won't resurrect a truly dead battery, but it was worth a try, and sure enough it brought this battery back from the nearly dead. After a charge, it produced about 29 amp hours on a 10 amp discharge, and a second discharge gave 37 amp hours at that same rate. I even got 42 amp hours out of it at a 2 amp discharge rate. So I charged it back up and then discharged 20 amp hours from it before reinstalling it in the camper. 
This time, the lithium charger did begin to charge it, from a starting rate of about 9 amps tapering down to 1 over a 5-hour period. I only have scattered data points from this charge cycle, but Microsoft Excel fits a reasonable looking curve to them, and integrating the charge over time gives about 19.5 amp hours, even though I stopped the charge before the charger actually shut off. So I'm officially declaring this modification a success. It is possible to charge this particular lead acid battery with this specific lithium charger. However, if you didn't get lost in the flurry of numbers and circuit diagrams, which I do apologize for, can't help being an engineer sometimes, you may be wondering why this 20 amp charger never delivered more than 9 amps to the battery. The main reason for this appears to be wire size. The charger is located at one end of the camper and the lead acid battery is at the other end. It's a long wire run and the wire gauge is really not big enough. I measured a voltage drop of nearly a volt between the charger and the battery when the charger was outputting 8 amps. Because of this voltage drop, the charger thinks the battery voltage is much higher than it really is, and it goes right into constant voltage mode, where the charge current starts tapering down. The good news is that the voltage drop decreases as the charge current goes down. So the charger keeps on charging until the current drops below 1 amp, by which time the battery is nearly fully charged. It takes much longer to charge, of course. It took five times as long to put 20 amp hours back in this battery as it would have for the lithium one. But that's okay. The lead acid battery in this setup is really only intended for a backup. In fact, that's the one other change I made. My original design called for a second solar charge controller for the lead acid battery as well. But that now seems redundant. If there's enough sun to charge the lithium battery, it's highly unlikely that the lead acid battery would be needed. So here's the final configuration as it stands now, and there aren't any plans for more changes. You might reasonably ask, wouldn't this have been much easier without keeping the lead acid battery? Oh, yes it would have. In fact, none of these components would be needed. But where would have been the fun in that? If you made it to the end of this video, congratulations and condolences. I hope there was something useful or interesting in it for you. You're welcome to like and or comment as you see fit. And please consider subscribing to the channel. As always, thank you very much for watching.